I'm also going to introduce myself. Um, my name is Simha Reddy. I'm a medical director for the um, Homeless Patient Aligned Care Team, essentially the VA's uh, primary care medical home uh, for homeless veterans. Um, and yeah, I'm glad to be, uh, be able to be with you this morning. Are you guys just starting your block right now? Is this the first week of it? Okay, fantastic. And you guys got to hang out with Sarah for a couple hours? Sarah Steinkruger? Excellent. Okay. Um, so to yeah, answer your wait, question, wait. it looks like the evaluations were slightly higher in the second block. Okay. But, uh, whatever you're more, most comfortable with. All right. We'll give it a try. So hi, everybody. Um, I've got, uh, I've sent you two files. One of them is um, an article from a few years back uh, that Jared Klein from Harborview and I wrote just sort of um, general sort of uh, the approach to the homeless patient uh, caring for, for people experiencing homelessness and touches on a number of different specific conditions, things like diabetes in this population, uh, infestations, et cetera. So just a little bit of uh, background um, or additional reading if you, if you want. Um, the other is a PDF of the um, PowerPoint that uh, I created the first go round for this um, lecture. And uh, I found that I struggled with it mostly because I couldn't see your, your amazing faces while I also had my screen shared. So I'm just going to talk a little bit today. Um, so today, for this next uh, 40 minutes or so, we're going to talk about caring for people experiencing homelessness. Um, before I get started, how many people, if you can just raise your hand on the screen, how many people uh, are from, had been living in the Seattle area prior to, to moving here for residency? So about half the folks, okay. And for the rest of you, when you moved here for residency, were you a little bit surprised by sort of the level of homelessness that you saw? Um, see you shaking your head no, John. Um, so the, uh, I, I gotta say, so when I, I came out here for residency maybe 10, 12 years ago now, um, and between then and now, there's been a pretty significant change and significant growth in the amount of homelessness affecting our community. Um, and uh, much more apparent, I think, than, than it was even when I, when, when I first arrived. Um, tents sort of uh, spread further, uh, um, a, a sort of greater preponderance of tents out in the community, uh, struggling to get people in the shelter more than I ever did before. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big issue affecting this community in particular, but certainly many, many communities across the country. So for today, I want to talk a little bit about a little bit about a bit of background on sort of local homelessness, um, a little bit of discussion on the connection between health and homelessness, and then a few principles of care, uh, touching on trauma-informed care, uh, the idea of harm reduction, and the idea of housing first. And then at the end of it, we'll sort of just uh, talk a little bit about um, general advice and tips for um, uh, physicians and providers caring for people experiencing homelessness. Um, before we get started, though, I wanted to just sort of share a quote um, from Rudolf Virchow. So like Virchow's and Virchow's nodes, Virchow's triad, um, sort of father of modern, modern pathology, but also the father of social medicine. So in 1848, and this is, um, you know, shortly after a, um, a uh, plague had hit his community uh, that affected a lot of people struggling with poverty. Uh, he said something that I think really resonates today, which is that medicine is a social science and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. Um, now that is not a universally held belief, but I think it's something that I feel pretty strongly about. And I, I, you know, some of you may as well, that um, we, in our position as physicians and providers, we are privileged to, to hear the stories of our patients and I think obligated to, to be their advocates, um, not just in the moment, but in terms of greater system change. And I think homelessness is one of those areas that is, um, um, 
I think touches on, uh, brings that home particularly well. But thinking about homelessness here in particular, in this community, uh, if you've got my PDF up, you may, you can look at some of the charts uh, on there, but um, how do you get a sense of how much homelessness there is in the community? Has anybody heard of something called the one night count? Either here or somewhere else? Erica, can you tell us a little bit about what you know about the one night count? Um, so I'm coming from San Francisco. I was born and raised there. Um, gotcha. So pretty consistently, it happens generally on an annual or biannual basis um, where volunteers uh, and also um, just general public health um, uh, employees uh, in the city go and do a uh, census of the homeless population. Yeah, absolutely. And um, here in Seattle, in fact, it's been so currently it's a requirement by the Department of Housing and Urban Development to get some federal funds, you have to do one of these counts every year. The idea is to get some sense of how much homelessness is in your community. And it is a um, extremely rough estimate because it is, as you said, uh, just a point in time, right? So here in Seattle, kind of uh, middle of January every year, people go out throughout King County, walk in the streets, driving around, and they try to count up the number of people that they see who look like they're homeless. Um, and that means, you know, cars that have their windows fogged up and look like somebody is living inside, the number of tents that are outside, the number of people in doorways, alleyways, the number of people sitting in emergency waiting rooms, um, and of course, the number of people in various shelters. And so on any given night in King County, uh, which is a, has about a million people or so, um, there's a, between 11 and 12,000 people homeless on any given night, and that is men, women, and children. Um, and half of those people are um, in shelters, and the other half are unsheltered. Now, this may be different for, is anybody here from New York City? Any chance? Uh, for those of you who might be familiar with it, homelessness looks different in different places. So in New York City, for example, in New York State, there is a right to shelter. And so people who are in uh, New York State, most of them tend to be in shelter. Not all, everybody, but most. Here, there's no such thing. And so there are some shelters out there, but they only cover about half the people who need, who need it. All right. Um, and so for those of you coming from elsewhere, it's certainly like when I have uh, friends or family who visit from elsewhere, the, one of the questions that comes to mind is typically, why are there so many homeless people in Seattle? And I think that's actually two separate questions, kind of what they're getting at. So the, the first question is, what explains that variation between communities? Um, so why is Seattle different from Salt Lake City and why, you know, and different from San Francisco, different from Austin, et cetera? And the second is, that second question is what factors put someone at risk for becoming homeless? So what are those individual factors? So in terms of explaining the variation between communities, I mean, it seems like you might think about, hey, could it be climate or could it be the level of services or whatever it might be? The thing, like basically the only thing that explains the variation in homelessness between communities is the rent. What is, your, what is a gap in affordable housing? So King County over the years has seen a tremendous growth in uh, economically and in population and has failed to create the affordable housing to keep up with it. And so if you wanted to predict for any given community, what is, how many people are going to be homeless, you, all you got to do is look at how many, um, what is the affordable housing gap. And so uh, to give you a sense of this, um, for King County, to affordably rent a one bedroom apartment at fair market value. And when I say affordable uh, housing, I mean, you're not paying more than 30% of your income. So to affordably rent a one bedroom apartment here in King County, you need to be making $69,000 a year. Now, you guys are probably not making, you guys are not making $69,000 a year. You guys are probably not able to rent a place affordably. And you are professionals, right? Like you have a tremendous amount of education and privilege and 
compare this against a lot of our patients, right? As an example, a number of your patients, whether you're at Harborview or the VA or anywhere else, they rely on social security disability income, right? A typical SSI income is $823 a month. That's a far cry from the, you know, 5,000 or so you need to, to be able to live somewhere affordably. Another way of looking at this is an affordable housing gap. How many homes are we missing? And so for every 100 people who make less than 30% of our, um, the area median income, so that would be people who make $34,000 or less as an individual person, only 29 of those people can afford a place. At least the other 71 people can SOL. All right, so that is that is the variation between communities. That is why we have so much homelessness here. Now the second part of the question though is if we're gonna have a certain amount of homelessness in our community, because that's what we've decided as a community. We have decided as a region that we are gonna have people who are homeless because we have chosen not to allow for development. We have chosen not to invest in affordable housing at the federal, state, and county level and city level. Now that we have a number of people who are going to be homeless, which people are going to choose, which people are going to be homeless? And there, it's really the people you'd expect, right? The people who have vulnerabilities of various types. So maybe they have a physical health vulnerability, a mental health vulnerability, a disability, maybe a substance use disorder. Um, maybe they carry the weight of racism, right? Uh, if you are black in this community or any community, you know, um, years of accumulated wealth and lack of generational wealth um, play a role, and which is why you see significant um, racial disparities uh, in uh, homelessness in this, in this place. Uh, perhaps you have, child, you have suffered from childhood trauma, you've been um, uh, part of foster care and not had a good transition out of foster care, maybe you've had a history of incarceration. Whatever the vulnerability, you add all these things up and the people with the most vulnerabilities uh, tend to be most likely to, to become homeless because they lack a safety net. Uh, this should not come as a surprise, right? Now, the question is, what does it matter to us, right? And it matters to us because it affects the way that we can provide care and affects the kind of care that our patients can, can um, uh, receive. Um, before we go further, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a break now and talk about um, a few terms that I'd like you to know. So if you've got that PDF up, uh, it's got a list of things and I'll just run through them one by one. The first is permanent supportive housing or housing first. Has anybody heard this term before? All right, Lauren, can you uh, tell us, can you fill up folks in a little bit on kind of what you know about it? So that's what you get for shaking your head. I mean, it's a uh, yeah. Amazing. Sorry, I'm participating. Um, yeah, I think it's just the concept that it's extremely difficult to get anywhere, like providing um, other auxiliary homeless services to someone who just if you're not going to actually provide them with housing. And so yeah. the concept is is that first you get the person in some sort of stable housing situation, and then you can pro provide other auxiliary services such as medical care, or not that you can provide them then, but rather that they're gonna be far more effective as long as like, if they actually have a place to live. 100%, right? Like, here's the thing, if I were to develop a, a drug or alcohol addiction now, and um, even with a really supportive family, even with uh, savings, even with a really supportive workplace uh, and a home, it would be really hard to, to overcome this addiction. It, it's just hard. Um, or to, to overcome a mental health disorder, or whatever it may be. And so the idea that uh, I need to prove myself worthy of housing first doesn't make any sense at all. But this is the way we thought about things, you know, 15 years ago. And this idea of housing first, which is exactly as Lauren said, you can't do much of anything until you, you know the fundamentals are there, was pioneered or proven really to work uh, first here in Seattle. Uh, the Downtown Emergency Service Center, which is a, a really phenomenal homeless organization, uh, worked with King County to create something called 1811 Eastlake. Anybody here live on Capitol Hill? 
Um, if you ever are going from Capitol Hill to downtown and you're crossing over Denny Way or over Denny and kind of going over that bridge right over I-5, if you look to your left, there's this kind of blue building and, you know, one of these uh, uh, cookie cutter uh, 90s era uh, apartment buildings. And that is probably one of the most important buildings in all of Seattle and, and this country because that place, 1811 Eastlake, proved that housing first, a permanent supportive housing is effective at helping people stay housed and participate in care. Uh, the people who entered into that program, um, and they were all people struggling with uh, chronic alcohol use disorders and homelessness. Um, the monthly cost to the system dropped from eight or $9,000 a month to $2,000 a month, and people were housed, right? This is a really powerful statement. Uh, one of the major innovations in homelessness, permanent supportive housing. And the other piece I want to I want to make clear though is that permanent supportive housing does not require that people eventually participate in care. Like they don't have to go and become sober or um, change their life uh, dramatically. They just need to abide by the rules of that apartment building or wherever it might be. Um, but they get help along the way, a case manager checking up on them and whatnot. Really, really, really effective way, uh, especially in managing chronic homelessness. So that's the first major innovation in homelessness. Somebody heard of uh, something called rapid rehousing. This is the other major innovation in homelessness. So rapid rehousing is this idea that, in some way you might think about kidney injury, right? Um, chronic and, and acute. You might think of homelessness, chronic and acute. So permanent support housing, think of it as akin to dialysis, right? Like it helps keep, the, keep people well and, and living for a while. Um, who have often struggled with a lot of really significant um, barriers. Rapid rehousing is this idea that, hey, shit happens, stuff can happen, people can become homeless for a wide variety of reasons. And sometimes people just need a little bit of a leg up, right? They just, or they just need a hand up and they will get, they will do okay on their own if you just give them a little bit of space and time. So the idea is you provide, um, uh, rental assistance for three to six months, move-in costs, that kind of thing. And this might come in the uh, wake of a job loss or uh, um, a medical um, crisis or whatever it might be. Really effective approach to care um, for the for a selective, select population, right? So for people for whom you expect, they will eventually be able to get back and pay market rate housing because they're um, waiting on uh, they have a job lined up or they, you expect they'll be able to get a job lined up. Um, this is really good intervention. So permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing. These are two big interventions to get people housed permanently. The other is transitional housing. And this is kind of a long, been around for a lot longer. This is the idea that, hey, let's help you move into essentially shelter plus. Um, and you work with a case manager, try to work on whatever those barriers are and get you back on your feet. Tends to be a little bit more expensive, not quite as effective um, as by the evidence, but can be the right fit for some people. And then emergency shelter. This is probably what you guys actually think about when you think about homelessness, right? Like these are mats on the ground or cots in a church basement. Um, and there is a wide variety of these uh, spread out throughout King County and Seattle. So for example, um, a couple names that I want you to just be aware of, the DESC, Downtown Emergency Service Center. This is uh, had, has had its main shelter down on 3rd Avenue for many years. Currently, they have picked up and moved all of their people to the red line in Renton. Um, they're one of the most evidence-based, uh, proactive homeless organizations you can find. They pioneered that 1811 Eastlake. They um, understood early on that COVID was a, a, a serious danger to their people and um, invested in a hotel for everybody, essentially and probably help stop um, the pandemic in its tracks in its population. The William Booth Center, this is uh, primarily veterans, placed it's down in uh, the ID district. Um, Union Gospel Mission, this is another the very, very low barrier um, shelter, um, kind of faith-based organization. Um, so you just may hear some of these terms bandied about. Um, and if you ever have questions about them, just reach out to me or your social worker and they can give you some more information on what to expect in those particular places. Uh, 
Uh, next up, encampments. So there are both official encampments and um, unofficial encampments. Um, there's a place called Nicholsville, 1073, 1074. These are kind of official encampments. These are places that kind of run on their own. Um, they may have stay at a um, church property, for example. They may have um, bathroom fun site, that kind of thing. But increasingly, what you see is a wide variety of unofficial encampments uh, spread throughout the city. And um, these um, people may not want to be in shelter because uh, they fear violence there, infestations, um, those kind of things. The, um, sorry, just one moment. Oh, but he's all set. He should. He said he should just come and see me Thursday. Yeah. Oh, hydroxyzine. I'll put it in. Okay. But he's gonna. It'll be about twenty minutes. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. Um, there's a patient issue. The um, anyway, encampments. Um, during a pandemic, if I were homeless right now and didn't have a vehicle to sleep in, I'd probably choose to go with the tent. Um, a little bit safer than. Uh, shelter, et cetera. Um, but our city has chosen to um, uh, remove encampments kind of throughout the city um, and just cause a lot of disruption there. Um, that is maybe on hold here in the near future. But uh, uh, against CDC advice, our community continues to, to ask encampments to get up and leave. and. Uh, uh, anybody heard of the jungle? Okay, so the jungle is sort of the um, um, area um, underneath I-5 has a, a number of people. It, it's been an area of uh, quite a bit of violence in the past and including some murders. Um, not a lot of people staying there these days, as far as I'm aware. Um, but it's hard to know at any given time, but you may have patients who stay there intermittently and it's worth asking them about whether they feel safe there, whether they're open to other possibilities. A couple of other things just to keep in the back of your mind in terms of definitions, uh, hygiene centers. So when you're working with your patients, they need to take showers, they need to do the laundry. There's a handful of hygiene centers spread throughout the city. Um, Urban Rest Stop is one that has a couple locations. Um, the Compass Hygiene Center down in Pioneer Square, uh, currently closed for just a moment, um, but should open up again in a couple of months. Um, there's not a lot of places where you're allowed to go to the bathroom if you're homeless, and these places allow that. And finally, medical respite. Um, especially if you're at Harborview, you may discharge your patients to a place called Jefferson Terrace or the Edward Thomas Medical Respite Program, which is right next door to you over in the um, um, uh, affordable housing building. Um, uh, directly um, uh, to the north of Harborview. Really amazing place. Created about 10 years ago um, by Leslie Enzian and in partnership with a number of other people and uh, really takes a, a harm reduction approach to care. And what that means is that, um, uh, you know, you can continue to use or drink whatever it may be, although you've got resources if you want to stop, um, but we will provide you the care that you need including IV therapies um, and just respite of all sorts. So a real model for the rest of the country. All right, any questions about that? Lauren? Yeah, is, um, does the encampment right next to the VA have a name yeah. and is it official or unofficial? Is that risk of being cleared? Can you just? Yeah, great question, Lauren. Um, it does not have an official name. It's got probably 20-ish people staying there, I'd say, at any given time. Not everybody's a veteran, maybe a third to half. I don't know, I'm just sort of guessing right now. Um, yeah, it got cleared last fall in November. Sorry, I'm just going to get something on my computer here. Um, and that was a real travesty, frankly. Um, they came in, cleared it out, and it ended up leading to two hospitalizations, new suicidal ideation in one patient, um, like four or five patients who had to come in for uh, medication refills. 
it was a bad scene all around. And uh, um, I will say it was not my proudest moment either. I ended up uh, uh, screaming at a cop there and it was uh, ended badly for everybody involved. But it's recurred since, right? Like you clear the encampment, people come right back um, because they have nowhere else to go. Um, in March, the, uh, in, you know, in the setting of the pandemic, uh, myself, Nancy Sugg, Leslie Anzian, um, uh, as well as uh, uh, of Harborview, and then uh, Richard Waters of um, Neighbor Care, um, Mary Yang of the DSC, uh, and Herbie Duber of Harborview as well. Uh, all of us wrote a letter to the mayor and the navigation team, which was responsible for making these, clearing these encampments, asking them to, to pause or to stop in light of the pandemic. And um, they did for about two months or so, uh, and then restarted. Um, and more recently, politically, uh, what's happened is there's been a move to defund the navigation team um, in the most recent uh, Seattle City Council budget. Okay. Sorry, guys. One just one just one moment. Thanks, guys. Sorry about that. The um. So I don't I don't know if that answers your question, Lauren. Um, but yeah, it's at risk for sure, um, and it sucks. Uh, any other questions about that? So just from the support of housing, rapid rehousing, these are kind of the general tools. None of them are uh, funded at scale. Um, we have emergency shelter. We only have about half of what we need. Um, and there's a handful of hygiene centers around and medical respite is really amazing, but uh, there's only about 30 beds for the entire region. Okay. Now, but that connection between homelessness and health, right? So why does it matter to us as physicians? And it is, you would be hard pressed to come up with a condition um, that is more dangerous than homelessness when it comes to health. So you're, um, so the, the typical life expectancy for somebody in King County is around 75, almost 80 years. Uh, anybody want to take a stab at uh, the life expectancy expectancy of someone experiencing homelessness? Anybody think it's in the 70s? 60s? 50s, anybody? Okay, a couple of takers there. Anybody in the 40s? All right, so 47 uh, was the mean age of death of somebody experiencing homelessness. Now, that's quite not, a, not quite a life expectancy, but it's pretty close. And in a number of different um, prospective cohort studies, Oh, thanks, Lauren. I'm seeing the. Uh, um, yeah, I see 50, 58. Um, it, it's been shown to be kind of in the 40s and, and early 50s, and a number of different cohorts across both the US and Canada. And, you know, your life, your mortality rate is threefold higher in any given year. It's ninefold higher if you are unsheltered. Um, yeah, I mean, try to think of a, a cancer, uh, heart disease, diabetes, anything really that makes it this, that's quite this dangerous. Now, how does it work, right? Uh, it's a little bit of a two-way street. You know, your poor health can lead to homelessness, right? If you, um, people uh, entering into homelessness often have higher rates of severe mental illness, PTSD, substance use, traumatic brain injury. Half of the people entering into homelessness have had some traumatic TBI injury at some point in their past. Uh, mild cognitive impairment, especially as we see the boomer um, uh, generation, uh, big boomer generation growing old. We're gonna see more and more people suffering from kind of mild and moderate dementia entering into homelessness for the first time in their 50s and 60s. It's probably that it's the fastest growing um, age group in homelessness. And then of course, there's the usual typical medically uh, uh, disabling conditions, things like a back injury that puts you out of work, um, uh, a medical bill that causes you to lose your home or um, 
uh, savings, that kind of thing. And the flip side is how does homelessness lead to poor health, right? So the rates of violence, both physical and sexual, are off the charts for both men and women. You have the exposure to elements, uh, skin conditions, uh, infestations, lice, scabies, uh, that sort of thing, um, foot issues, increased risk of infection with hepatitis, HIV, uh, tuberculosis, um, um, all sorts of soft skin, soft tissue infections. Food insecurity, right? Like even if you want to eat healthy, it's hard. It's really, really hard. Um, your ability to hold on to your, your medications in a way that's safe. Um, and then the other piece that, that I want us to be aware of is the stigma that they, people encounter when they enter the healthcare system, and it is high. Um, the, uh, is there, I'll just share a quick story. Um, I was down at the Downtown Emergency Service Center one time, and uh, one of the nurses there asked me to see somebody, and it's not a veteran, but she asked me to stop in anyway. And I walk in, and the guy is laying there in a bed, and he is like emaciated. He, he looks terrible. He is covered in sores, uh, and it is pretty obvious because he can't, he's had a laryngectomy. He can't speak uh, more than a few words. It's very difficult for him to get across what he wants to say. And I look at him laying there and I'm like, my God, what is, what is going on? This guy obviously needs to be in a hospital, right? And she's like, no, 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 that's not the problem. This is all chronic. I also forgot to mention that his, his arm is at a weird angle. He has a chronically broken left arm. It's just off. She says, none of this is the problem. This is not the reason I want you to see him today. And she has him stand, sit up. And she lifts up the back of his shirt, and on, on his thoracic spine, there is a softball sized abscess. No idea how deep it goes, right? Like, it is just sitting there, and it is ugly, and it is scary. Um, the, and I ask, you know, what's going on? Why is this guy not in the hospital right now? And she says, listen, I, I sent him up, and, um, and I won't say which hospital right now, but, um, he got there, I called ahead to give report, but he got there and they sent him right back. And she had pulled up the, the notes because she had access to them. And it said, uh, a resident had put in their note, uh, patient here for chronic pain, uh, told to follow up with primary care and kind of referencing that left arm, right? Uh, there was an exam, including lungs cleared off, quotation, et cetera, but never got the history that he had this giant abscess. And he had tried to get it across to them, but, you know, there was a stigma associated. So in speaking with him now, I, I told him, like, hey, listen, man, your, your life's in danger right now. We really got to get you back somewhere. And he was really adamant. He understood the danger, and he said, absolutely not. I'm not going back there because and he was crying um the kind of tears of rage because he felt so disrespected he had been shamed right there in the in the emergency room at the end of the day he finally decided agreed to go into a different hospital but i'll tell you the thing that sits with me about that that visit is not the not the actions of the of that resident right it's the fact that that could have been me that could have been me uh doing that assessment seeing him being hurried in a rush and just moving on, right? And it is, it, it drove home for me the importance of when you are seeing somebody who's experiencing homelessness, it actually, you got to take a moment and stop and take extra time and uh, to figure it out. Uh, because the majority of people in studies that have been done um, of people experiencing homelessness, they have uh, had a um, uh, encountered a stigma based on their housing status. And sometimes it's like that severe, but sometimes it's more subtle. It's a provider who doesn't want to shake hands, you know, pre-COVID times, um, or, you know, being stared at in the waiting room because they have their luggage with them, that kind of thing. So anyway, okay, sorry, that's my soapbox. I will, I will move on. Um, 
I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I realize I have been um, talking for a good long while. Uh, in the like PDF that you have, uh, there is the sort of section on tough choices. And the idea was to sort of illustrate some of the, the barriers to care that somebody might have, things like the lack of minutes on their phone, lack of reliable transportation, lack of access to a bathroom um, when you're experiencing, uh, when you've got conditions that uh, require to use a diuretic or uh, laxative. Um, but uh, all that's pretty obvious, so I'll move on. Um, there, are, there are a handful of kind of specific things that I, that I think are important to do in the care of people experiencing homelessness, but I want to talk more generally about three broad categories, uh, three broad principles. The first is trauma-informed care. Actually, let me pause there for a moment before I jump into this. Any questions, any comments? Okay. Uh, feel free to type in, by the way, as, as we're talking. The first is trauma-informed care. Has anybody heard this term trauma-informed care before? Okay. Um, there's a number of different definitions of it, but it, it's essentially having an understanding of how trauma um, affects the, life's, the life of individuals seeking service. Um, that, sorry, one moment. Hi. He is not, you know, Skype him, thanks. Um, that, that when people show up to you, they're, that they have overcome a tremendous amount to get to you. And the, the thing is, you will never know 90% of it. You just won't. I almost think of it like universal precautions, right? Like when you see somebody, you always use universal precautions. You wash your hands before and after, you might wear gloves, et cetera. Likewise, you don't know what trauma somebody has seen or felt before they show up to your door. It, it may be thing, you know, severe childhood traumas. It may be small stuff where they have felt slighted at the front desk. Uh, on the bus ride in, they may have gotten chewed out by the bus driver. Uh, they might be carrying, um, they may have been called a racist slur. You know, you don't know. And so your job is to create a place of safety and of, uh, that is welcoming and safe for your patient. And I think a lot of us sort of assume that we do that just because we are nice people and good people. And frankly, if you're in this program, like you, you wouldn't have been here if you didn't care about other folks and you weren't a kind and decent human being or could at least fake it pretty well. Um, but I think we need to be really intentional about it. And what I mean by that is when somebody comes in, we say, we are so glad you are here today. I, I'm really glad you made it today. I'm really looking forward to seeing you again. Um, it is shaking hands when handshaking becomes a thing again for us. Um, it is reaching out a little bit extra, making an extra phone call to make sure that they know that they care, that you care about them. Um, and it is systemic issues, right? It is making sure that your clinic does not turn away people just because they show up five minutes late. Um, it is asking permission before you jump into doing a physical exam. All of these kinds of things matter. So at the end of the day, ask yourself, what am I doing to help this person feel safe and welcome here with me today? And that'll get you a long way into trauma-informed care. There's a lot of curriculum around this. There's a lot of uh, reading that can be done, but that's, that's what I think of it in terms of the fundamentals. Any questions about that? All right, it seems sort of obvious, right? The next thing is harm reduction. Um, and this is sort of the work to minimize the negative health or social consequences of some behavior. And a really, has anybody heard this term harm reduction before? Hopefully some of you have. Needle exchange is a really good example of harm reduction, right? Where, um, yeah, ideally somebody would not use uh, uh, IV drugs, but how do we minimize that harm that's gonna entail? But it's not all related to, to drugs, right? Um, and it can happen at a number of different levels. So at a policy level, this might mean creating needle exchanges or safe consumption sites. At a provider level, this might um, ask somebody, hey, are you interested in cutting back or stopping your use? Um, 
but it's okay if you're not going to. And, and if they're not interested in stopping right now, fine. Let's just make sure you do it as safely as possible. Um, prep is a form of, in some ways, uh, harm reduction, right? That, well, I'd say it's actually a little bit more than that, but um, making sure that somebody who is using drugs might use, uh, that they are getting uh, prep counseling, hepatitis A and B immunizations, referral to needle exchanges, all that would be part of harm reduction. But I, I think that a little bit bigger than that, it's a sort of an attitude, right? So somebody who has, um, I have a colleague who um, uh, takes care of a patient who has a lot of food insecurity. And so they actually are limited in, in the kind of behaviors they can change in terms of based on their, their income and, and what food availability they have. And so they've come up with a plan together to reduce the harm related to that. And so at the beginning of the month, they have higher levels of some insulin. And by the end of the month, they've tapered down. Now that is a real... Um, indictment, I think, of, of the society in which we live, but it is a form of um, harm reduction to some degree. Likewise, I have a patient um, who uses cocaine once a month, really worried about a stroke risk, and so for the few days before and a couple days after, he uses amlodipine. But in between those times, his blood pressure is just fine. Just sort of it's a, a space in which you do your best to listen to your patient and meet them there. Um, and think creatively about it. Any questions about that principle? Okay. Uh, next up, housing first. We kind of talked, uh, Lauren shared a little bit about this. And I think that's, you did a really uh, great job of explaining it. Um, basically, no one needs to be housing ready. And you may get that kind of pushback from uh, um, social workers or other folks intermittently. And we need to be advocates for our patients saying that, yes, of course, people uh, deserve housing. Um, all right, I'm gonna pause for a moment. Any questions at all? Okay. Couple changes with COVID around homelessness. Um, so a couple things. Number one, there's been a, a um, some of our nonprofits locally, like the DSC really led the, led the crusade in terms of reducing risk by, um, getting people into hotels, and this may be a new method for managing homelessness, that um, individual housing units are really the way to go. And, and I think many, many people would um, strongly feel that's the case and hope and are hoping that we don't go back to congregate mats on the ground when all this is done. Um, it is also very hard to get people into shelters these days. Um, it is a constantly changing thing from one day to the next. It's hard to know who's open and who's not. Um, uh, so really relying on your social worker to be up to date, I think it's, it's going to be important. All right. Um, next up, if you can pull up your PDF, um, I've got a list of just sort of tips for providers that are kind of diagnosis specific. Um, as an example, hypertension, right? Like starting somebody on an ACE and a diuretic Maybe those are great choices for the hypertension, but on, from my perspective, starting somebody on a calcium channel blocker might be a safer way to start, um, just because if you're worried about the ability to follow up in terms of, um, of uh, laboratory testing, for example. Also diuretics, I mean, are you gonna put your person on a diuretic that's gonna get them arrested because they have to pee in an alley and can't get to a bathroom? I mean, we at least got to think it through and make sure that people are aware of it. The other piece is sort of making sure that, that your patients are smart. They, they know their lives better than you will ever know them. And giving them agency is really important. So saying, hey, this is a medication to lower your blood pressure. It's going to make you pee or it's going to help you with your heart failure and make you breathe easier. It says take it every day, but you don't have to take it at the exact same time every day. Pick the time that makes the most sense for you. Um, cirrhosis, right? Like this is a difficult problem where you have to provide both diuresis, but also um, deal with hepatic encephalopathy sometimes. Maybe lactulose is not the best first call. If you can get their insurance program to pay for Rifaximin, that's a nice choice to begin and then go to lactulose if you need to. 
Um, think about mental health, right? A lot of times when people think about homelessness, they get this picture in their mind of what it means and they have this idea that it is mostly schizophrenia and mood disorders or it's like thought disorders. That's not the case. Like probably the most common um, uh, mental health concern you'll run into is depression and anxiety, um, often as a consequence of homelessness. Um, likewise with substance use disorders, you know, I think it's, a, it's really important to remember that a lot of people may start using after they become homeless for pretty good reasons or seemingly good reasons. As an example of this, um, meth use is really common here in Seattle. If you were experiencing homelessness right now, why would you consider using meth? Why would you consider smoking meth right now? Why would that not be the craziest idea in the world, potentially? Gabriel, what do you think? Oh. What might be an advantage, I guess. I'll put it that way. Um, I guess if you like didn't want to think about all your problems, wanted a way to like escape, um, maybe if you were surrounded by other people who were doing it, I think there could be right. a lot of reasons why. Absolutely, right? Like escape is a huge piece of it, right? Um, you know, the five or ten dollars you spend on a substance may is certainly a lot cheaper than a hotel room for the night, um, and gives you at least a moment of respite, maybe. Um, but the reasons people use are really complex, right? And reasons that people often come up with sometimes it's escape, sometimes it's sexual activity, some, but sometimes it is because your life is horrible and that is a temporary fix. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, potentially. Sometimes people just need to stay, stay awake through the night, right? We talked about violence and sometimes that first night or two can be really scary and um, you're afraid to, afraid to fall asleep or you are struggling with really severe depression and you can't get an appointment for two months with a psychiatrist and you just need the energy to get up and go for a moment and this feels like the right way to do it. And yeah, obviously it's not, going to help in the long run, right? But for many people, the reason people drink or use um, or make choices that on the surface seem uh, to not make sense is that in fact, it may actually be somewhat rational. Um, this is not to condone um, drug use or alcohol use, but, but to say that you really need to, to have a deep understanding of where your patients are coming from. Um, and the reasons for someone's particular choices are um, often complex. Um, anyway, uh, other sort of uh, um, just sort of general practices, especially in the primary care range or region, which is kind of what I do. Um, so like I mentioned, be intentionally welcoming. Make sure you ask, what do you want to, what do you want to make sure we talk about today? What do you want to try to accomplish today? Really practical stuff like paperwork, Make sure people have reduced their bus passes. Um, make sure that if somebody comes to you with disability paperwork, that you fill that out. It is super annoying, but it can be incredibly helpful and life-changing for people. Um, ask, people may be worried about, uh, or um, embarrassed to, to share that, hey, my phone's gonna be out of minutes or, um, whatever, you know, I'm not going to be able to afford this medication or I may not be able to pick it up. So asking for teach back and asking about, hey, do you have any worries about the plan we've created can be really helpful. Um, in general, uh, keeping up to date on this issue, uh, there's a number of ways of doing it. So uh, in a much more in-depth way, uh, a couple of fellow colleagues, Courtney Teagle, Shada Alamy, Don Taniguchi, uh, down in Pioneer Square, um, Amy Bernstein are all putting together an educational resource around this issue. There uh, are two rotations around homeless health, uh, both with me, um, where you see patients in clinic, but also in outreach in the community, uh, encampments, um, shelters, and that kind of thing, um, but also at, through the Pioneer Square program, which is a really phenomenal rotation. Uh, the VA is, is a particularly unique approach uh, situation because it uh, creates a, we made a commitment to end veteran homelessness, 
and obviously haven't done that um, about 10 years ago now, but we were able to cut it by half. And most of that's because we've invested in housing. And so it's nice to sometimes see a um, system where you at least have some of the resources that you need to, to solve this problem. All right, I'm just gonna pause there um, just because it's 11.55 and I realize I've just been talking straight at you for 40 minutes. Um, what are the questions on your mind? What are the sort of things you're thinking about or, or patients you're worried about um, that you've seen recently who've experienced homelessness? Has anybody had a patient with, who's been experiencing homelessness, either in primary care or in the inpatient setting recently? Okay, Lauren, do you got somebody? Can you tell us a little bit about that person? So it's a really sad story. It wasn't actually my patient, but it was a patient on my team, so I, I rounded on the patient. Um, but he was a guy who, I, I was in the ICU, that's like an important, um, Yeah. actually, was no I don't think it was because one of the other people in the ICU is on this call I don't think it was his yeah. patient either though it wasn't yours right Andy no okay. uh, anyway he presented and um, um, was living in his van and presented with acute kidney failure to the best of our knowledge um, and it was a very complex situation because he needed a lot of very aggressive interventions and it was and he was not consentable and um it was it was difficult to figure out who was his true next of kin um and what he would want in in this situation um but i think it had a fairly um good outcome which we were able to get a hold of family and actually they were like in contact with the patient and he wasn't like ostracized from his family. And so yeah. they, they made a lot of um, I, I, what felt like, obviously it's always hard to tell when your patient never wakes up, but what felt like um, patient centered decisions around the types of interventions that we ended up offering him. Um, but it was challenging because we didn't really know what his kidney, if his kidney failure was truly acute or chronic when someone gotcha. comes in first time with a creatinine of, I don't remember what it was, but it was extremely high. And yeah. so anyway, um, yeah. I think the, uh, well, I'm sorry he had to go through that. I'm glad he, um, you were able to reach the family that, that he was still with. I think one of the things that, that you sometimes feel hopeless, um, but I'll say that uh, so I've been doing this now about eight years and uh, it is an unbelievably satisfying job because you get to see people get better, right? Like when people get housed, like they reconnect with family, they like start working again, they feel, they can feel happy again. And it is um, uh, a real joy to be able to get to witness that sometimes. And um, I think the more we learn about the systems in which we work, the the better able able we are to be that connecting piece for our, for our patients. Um, as things go on, um, and as you will inevitably see lots of patients experiencing homelessness um, through both primary care and uh, um, urine patient services. Um, feel free to reach out to, to me, to the folks at Pioneer Square. Um, if you've got questions, things that you're worried about, or just don't know how to navigate, and you wish you did. and um, we'll see what we can do to try and help. All right. Any other questions, things on your mind? Okay. I guess one kind of question, I don't, yeah. other people don't need to say if they're not interested, but I'm kind yeah. of curious to learn more about um, what clearing an encampment looks like and why, like, sort of from your perspective, a little bit more about the harms of that and how we should be thinking yeah. about that. So, um, and like the history of it and all that. Oh yeah. So the history goes back a long ways. In fact, um, so I mentioned that there's a, an official, sort of official tent city called uh, Nicholsville. It's named after Gre Mayor Greg Nichols from a few administrations back, um, where a group of people didn't have anywhere else to go, set up some tents, and then Greg Nichols tried to move them, and so they kept sort of hopscotching around to different spaces. 
to avoid being um, dispersed. And so for a while there, there had been a little bit of a detente between uh, homeless care providers and, uh, or homeless um, uh, people in the city, in the city um, in which, you know, you got uh, a few days notice or weeks notice um, to try to move, move on or uh, to move to a different area um, if that area was needed uh, or needed to be cleared. Uh, and then increasingly, um, they've invoked something called sorry, essentially the sort of public health uh, or public safety issue. We're like, hey, we saw that you encroached on the sidewalk for a moment, the entire encampment needs to go because there's a public safety issue here. And by the way, if anybody else needs to go, feel free to, to hop off. I need to, get, need to get some lunch and get ready for the rest of the day. Um, the, um, and nowadays, uh, it is typically, or in, in the last, recent months, it has been primarily related to um, which encampments get the most complaints. And that often depends on which neighborhood they're in. Um, so Ballard, for example, got cleared a couple of times. Um, the, and the way it works, sometimes is somebody just comes in and takes everything. Otherwise, maybe they get a couple of days of outreach ahead of time. Um, and there's a lot of dispute around how much outreach actually exists and what that outreach looks like. Um, and then they're told essentially anything that's left here is going into the garbage uh, or ostensibly will be um, uh, put into safekeeping and you can get it later. Um, but there's a number of legal issues around this. Um, there's a lot of advocacy around this issue. Um, and I think it's one that will continue to be ongoing for some time. Um, and if people are resisting, do they like arrest people? Like what is sort of like, do they use violence? So um, typically people will, will move on, um, but the police are there and people can be arrested if they don't uh, move on or if they cause um, a disruption. Um, the, yeah. Uh, it, and so there's a number of organizations like the ACLU and local advocacy organizations that are trying to dot, you know, chronicle these and then document them. And um, the, uh, um, I think we continue to struggle with, um, as a community, with how to approach this issue, right? Because what we know is that we don't have enough shelter for everyone. We just don't. We are 6,000 beds short. Right. And so to say, hey, you can't, you need to move into shelter. And then we set aside a handful of beds and say, we want to move this encampment. So we have some set aside beds. You guys can move into them if you like. Um, while people who show up to your clinic or to the emergency room who want a shelter bed can't get into them. So there's a lot of uh, inequity in, on a number of different levels. And, you know, it's all tied in with um, certain equity around law enforcement as well, right? Um, you know, there is half of the people who got booked into King County Jail last year were people experiencing homelessness. Maybe it was 45%, something like that. Um, because they are the most visible, right? Like most people who use drugs in this community are not homeless. They are in their homes. But people who are outside and use are going to jail, more or less. And so um, there's a, a yeah. Uh, Happy to talk more about it um, with anyone who's interested, um, but uh, I want to make sure that we end on time for folks today. But happy to chat more with you, Lauren, or anyone else later. All right. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your listening to me uh, be on the soapbox, and I will uh, try to send some more resources to you as soon as they uh, become available through. Um, um, uh, up on our homeless website. All right. Thanks, guys.